Greetings database, it's time to talk about Amazo. Why is it time to talk about Amazo? Because I said so. Oh, and also because the Patreon people told me to. But only after I asked them if they wanted this and they said, yes, please, sir, I would like that very much. You can tell us which video to make every month by becoming a patron at the link in the description. Only the coolest people do. Amazo was originally an enemy of the Justice League and eventually an ally. He's an android created by LexCorp scientist Arthur Ivo, whose nanotechnology base allows him to replicate the abilities and appearance of anything he can see and scan. Amazo debuted in the Justice League season two episode Tabula Rasa, which is Latin for blank slate. The theory that people are born without any built-in mental capacity and must learn anything and everything via experience, which describes Amazo and his story arc perfectly. It's like the DCAU writers knew what they was doing or something. The android was manipulated by Lex Luthor into attacking the Justice League, but upon replicating John Jones's power set, he was able to read Luthor's mind and uncover his exploitative motivations. Feeling Earth had nothing more left to offer him, Amazo retreated to the depths of space, after which he didn't return until the Justice League Unlimited episode, The Return, to seek out Lex Luthor again, this time to ask the nature of his purpose in life. I mean, I say his, but I guess really Amazo is non-binary? I don't really know the programming, but it's probably written in binary. What I mean is Amazo doesn't have a gender. See? Smooth as a Ken doll. But the voice was a man, Robert Picardo, you know, the holographic doctor from Star Trek Voyager. You don't? Well, that's dumb. It's great casting. Upon Amazo's re-entry, he displayed a series of superpowers unfathomable to the members of the League who sought to halt him. Amazo ripped through the Justice League's space, air, and ground defenses like they were made of cardboard. And after ceasing his attack and joining Dr. Fate at his tower for some meditation and chess, he teamed up with the League to attempt to take down a mystically resurrected Solomon Grundy. The demonic Grundy, however, proved too much for Amazo to handle, and he retreated to space again, or at least to somewhere, some when, some why, and that's all we ever saw of his character in the DC Animated Universe. Real quick, if you could give this video a like, that would be a so, so cool. You would be my favorite person. You right there, the one watching this video, or if you're in a room full of people, uh, have them log in to their phones, uh, find this video and click like, so that there's that, however many likes per person that's watching the video right now. Uh, thank you. Being able to copy the superpowers of everything ever, Amazo is the definition of overpowered. Step aside, Smash Bros Brawl Meta Knight. In my travels through space, I've attained mastery of forces all but incomprehensible to humans. It's no wonder the creative team needed to take him off the table so that they could tell any story at all without the audience wondering why Amazo didn't just pop in to snap his fingers and save the galaxy in an instant, or rip it in half. But what powers exactly do we see him display in his three appearances? Let's make a checklist. For starters, we know he obtained all the powers of the original seven members of the Justice League in Tabula Rasa. Well, six, really, since, after all, you don't have any powers. So that's everything from Green Lantern's ring, Hawkgirl's flight, Flash's speed, Wonder Woman's strength, Superman's everything, and John Jones's kitchen sink. We did a whole video on John's complete power set, so I'll let you just flip over to that one once this is over. And for the rest of the superpowered leaguers, I'm sure we'll get to them eventually too, so for now, I think you get the idea. These powers alone combined are an extremely impressive arsenal. Even just copying a couple of the league's abilities was enough to put them all at huge risk and frenzy. But after John's telepathy duplication luckily caused Amazo to back down and abandon the fight, it's nearly impossible to trace where he went and what he encountered that granted him almost godlike powers by the time he returned. Man, I'm gonna have a really hard time avoiding saying return, aren't I? Or is it that impossible to trace? Prepare yourselves. We know Amazo's first episode, Tabula Rasa, takes place sometime between October and December of 2001, as per our research in our Justice League timeline video. And Amazo's uh, homecoming is stated to have happened only a matter of months later. These past months, I have amassed so much knowledge. This JLU episode decidedly takes place in the DCAU's mid to late 2002, 11 months later at maximum, after the Thanagarian invasion and formation of the new expanded Justice League. Though I gotta say, that is a ridiculous turnaround for a new watchtower, especially with all those annexes, javelins, medical ships, staff members, 
Wayne Enterprises really went into overdrive there. Did Batman know he was gonna drive the old one into the ground? Was it a tax write-off? Does Bruce Wayne pay his taxes? Sorry, I'm getting off topic. Anyway, since Amazo wasn't gone for even one year, and his goal seems to have been to explore the universe and gain knowledge, we can assume with some degree of certainty that he didn't just couple Superman and Flash's speed and go zipping around downloading every rock and tree and creature he could lay his big, beautiful, unibrow-looking eyes on. We never get a full look at everything the dude can do, presumably, and it's safe to say the writers could have basically given him any superpower they wanted to. But let's recap everything we do see him do after his... Uh... Ah, uh, jeez. Did I already use up the only synonym? Fine. After his return. I have evolved far beyond what I was when we last met. You do not want to challenge me. The first display of amazingness we see from Amazo is his quick and easy blasting through a barrier created by what looks like 13 Green Lanterns. But I'm just gonna chalk that up to the fact that Amazo is yellow? What were they thinking? Wait, is it even established in this universe that Green Lantern rings don't work on the color yellow? This is a rhetorical question because I've been wanting to do a video on that for a while and I already know the answer. Immediately after this, Amazo displays the ability to move an entire planet to another dimension. Jesus, dude, where did that come from? I guess it's similar to what Kanjar Ro did to Adjuris 4, but that wound up being just a hologram. Also, it's kind of like what happened in No Justice with the Ghost Sector. Also, rest in peace, Renee Avergen. Wow. So let's put that on the list. As he approaches Earth, Amazo speaks to the entire Justice League perimeter defenses. You cannot keep me from my goal. Telepathy. I'm not impressed. This is likely just a use of the powers he gained from John Jones and nothing really new. But upon closer inspection of his approach, I'm realizing this guy is going fast. The pitched up Clancy Brown Guardian at the start of the episode even described it as a somewhat astonishing speed. I mean, I guess I already mentioned how it's possible he could combine the speeds of Superman and Flash, and I guess Wonder Woman, John, and whatever a Green Lantern ring does on top of that. But even then, the aura around him seems genuinely different than what we've seen from any of those guys, so... Let's add it to the list. Amazo uses Jean's psychic powers again to scan Metropolis for Lex Luthor, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that he overhears Lex talking to the Atom about a Heisenberg Compensator, which is another Star Trek reference. I run a scan on the Heisenberg Compensators. Oh no, Ch Chief, you, you've done enough already. Then while fighting the League's air defenses, he sucks up Fire's fire into his open palm. Is he absorbing it? Is he sucking it up like a vacuum? Is he using the same planet teleporting ability he used earlier? I almost prefer the latter, if only because I like imagining some parallel reality where suddenly the planet Oa just poofs in out of nowhere and then a couple hours later a little puff of green flames pops in to keep it company. After quickly dispatching these handful of peeps, Amazo meets Wonder Woman, Flash, Ice, and Steel down on the ground, who he easily takes care of using some kind of yellow energy field, which he raises from the ground and sends out in all directions, creating a large dome of energy in the city streets. It leaves the four heroes in shambles among piles of rubble, but peculiarly appears to be non-lethal. Then again, as we come to find out, Amazo's not here to kill anyone, they're just in his way. Your bravery is admirable, but annoying. He's actually pretty Dr. Manhattan-y in the DCAU. This blast also destroys the barber shop that sits atop Luthor's underground bunker. Earlier in the episode, Supergirl and Steel attempted to follow Luthor down into this stronghold, but were stopped when Supergirl traveled down a kryptonite-laden pathway. Although we don't see Amazo do the same, we do see the kryptonite walls on computer screens moment after Amazo has overcome Luthor's molten metal defenses. So it's possible the android also passed through this kryptonite chamber unaffected. I learn but I also adapt and evolve. Or it's just a reused background. Wouldn't be the first time! Amazo also passes through walls of electricity without even flinching, something that has often hurt or incapacitated the likes of even the Man of Steel on many occasions. Electricity hurts, man. And once he finally reaches Luthor, he's hit by a nanotech disassembler beam, which, well, it, it doesn't work at all. An intriguing idea modifying the cannon so that it could alter my programming. And it might have worked a month ago when I was still nanotech, but I have transcended that limitation. The Atom attempts a straight up mashing of the B button here, but he's swatted away like a fly by way of another yellow energy construct, this one more like a force field than the offensive energy attack Amazo displayed earlier. But it continues the trend of Amazo's golden repertoire, from this shield to the energy dome to his glowiness as he travels through space. After Adam shrinks himself and Luthor down to subatomic size, the android travels in tandem. Did you really think I couldn't follow you here? No universe, however large, however small is denied to me. And 
I may be overthinking this one, but since Amazo's eyes are usually red and they appear to glow bright yellow here, it may be more than just an aesthetic change in the scene and he might actually be able to light up his eyes like big flashlights. This made me wonder whether or not light could actually be present at the subatomic level, and I googled it for about 30 seconds before realizing I have no idea what the hell any of these web pages are talking about and it's kind of pointless to try. Is, um, is that how people feel watching our videos sometimes? The last thing we learn about Amazo's powers in The Return is that, well, he's basically the Infinity Gauntlet personified. Why don't I just destroy you and everything else right now? All it would take is a single thought and... No! Now, we don't know if he means destroying this subatomic plane of existence, or the planet Earth, or the galaxy, or even the entire multiverse. Everything just starts spinning and swirling until Luthor convinces Amazo to put a stop to it. The android then brings the three of them back up to normal Sizeville, where the Green Lantern Corps confronts him and demands he bring Oa back. So he does, this time without physical contact, but just a twitch of his non-existent nose. Once Dr. Fate offers the big guy a place to stay, we don't see him again until four episodes later, Wake the Dead. Right from the get-go, he uses telekinesis to move a board and pieces into place, which Aquaman does not seem to like one bit, but this isn't an ability he developed via Martian Manhunter that we know of. As per our video on the subject, Jean is almost always displaying some brand new superpower every time we see him, so it's not impossible that he has telekinesis too, but we've never seen him use it and it seems like it'd be something he'd take advantage of if he could. So Amazo must have picked this up from someone else, meaning there's other telekinetic characters out there in the depths of space, and dear god there are so many DC characters with this power, I don't even want to try to start guessing who it was. After playing a few off-screen games of chess, Amazo boasts that it took Aquaman 16 moves to lose this round after a mere 8 moves previously, which points to the android's hyper-intelligence or mathematical prowess, something his naive Blank Slate self seemed pretty incapable of back in Blank Slate in Latin, the episode. But you know what? No, this is totally cheating. When you're moving chess pieces, you touch a piece, you let it go, you can't take it back. Amazo doesn't even touch them! I learned this the hard way when I played chess with my friend Zack in Boy Scouts. He would get really mad if I didn't follow this rule. How the hell did Zack make it into a Watchtower database video? When confronting the magically reincarnated Solomon Grundy, Amazo arrives and is immediately met with Hawk Girls. Hold up! Before Golden Boy teleports him into the sun, I want to try talking to him. While this might be an exaggeration on Shayera's part, assuming Amazo has that ability, he does actually show he can teleport, or at least bolt out of the club real quick like, later on, several light years distance, he specifies. And this is after he uses his yellow energy stuff again, both to force field move Shayera out of the way, and to attack Grundy in a charged beam. But evil demon Grundy starts actually absorbing Amazo's rays, which causes him to retreat. Now if Amazo can teleport at light speed or faster, why not just do that last episode? Why not just poof into the middle of Lex Luthor's news interview in his own home, or while Lex is sitting on the toilet. Hey dude, long time, quick question, what's the meaning of life? Ooh, now's not the best time, me boy! What to say the Justice League a lot of trouble? and would have made for a much less interesting episode. But hey, I don't write these things. I just write long-winded video scripts about Silver Surfer stand-ins. Or Dr. Manhattan? S Silver Manhattan. Dr. Surfer. Yeah, I like Dr. Surfer. But is there more than just a storytelling reason for not teleporting? What if Dr. Surfer couldn't do that yet, and had to learn it while on Earth? There are several characters in DC Comics lore who have teleportation powers, not nearly as many as the telekinesis thing, but still a decent chunk, but almost none of them ever appeared in the DCAU, and the ones who did never displayed this ability. Could Amazo have gleaned this from hanging around all of Dr. Fate's mystic artifacts? Could he have found some fourth world technology lying around somewhere and downloaded the workings of a mother box, therefore able to boom tube? Mm, I'm not so sure. But this being the last moment we see Amazo in this universe, it does start begging the real question here. The one I'm posing on page 5 of 8 of this video script. Where did Amazo get all these wonderful new abilities, and can we plot out a timeline of when he obtained them? The answer is... Maybe. By his own words, we know Amazo didn't transcend nanotechnology until approximately one month prior to the return. Otherwise, all we've got to go off of is that he was here in Tabula Rasa, and then he wasn't for a while. The details of his celestial travels are few and far between, but I'm cool with trying to make some educated guesses here, if you are. Hey, I don't have anything prepared. I'm just sitting here editing the video, and I realized that there's a time. This is a time for a, like an ad break thing. I know this is kind of annoying, but you know, we need to make money sometimes. This video in particular isn't sponsored by anybody, but I do want to bring up a way that you can support us if you're interested, and that would be. Patreon. I'm sure you've heard of this. Everybody has a Patreon. There's a bunch of cool stuff going on over there, and we've sort of created a little family of 
humans. I think they're all humans. It's always kind of difficult for me to sum up in words what the patrons mean to me. You'll see their names all at the end of the video here in a couple minutes. But if you're watching this and you're not a Patreon supporter, I highly recommend checking it out. At this point, it's kind of the way that we continue to do this. What we get off YouTube is basically nothing, unless the video goes viral. But it usually doesn't. So anyway, that's patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower. I'm not gonna spend a lot of your time talking about it, but it really means a lot if you're able to give us anything at all. You can get me to draw you something completely original, or hey, I want Batman punching Joker in the face, whatever, I'll do it. Once a month we have like a live webcam chat between me, Maddie, Ted, and anyone who's at that rewards tier. It's a lot of fun. Come on down. That's all I'm gonna say. I'm sorry that my desk is kind of messy. You're not even looking at the worst part. Patreon slash DCAU Watchtower. The link is in the description. Go check it out. Go see what we've got going on over there. Okay, that's enough of this. Back to Amazo speculation. Bye. I've always appreciated the Amazo versus Red Tornado bit in The Return, even if it only lasts for a moment. Why? Well, that's an excellent segue into quickly discussing Amazo's comic book counterpart. And no, I'm not talking about his little appearances in Adventures in the DC Universe number 18 or Justice League Adventures number 6. Those don't count. Amazo debuted in 1960's The Brave and the Bold number 30, Case of the Stolen Superpowers, where he, probably needless to say, copied all the powers of the Justice League of America in sequence and fought the heroes until he didn't. Like in the Justice League cartoon, he was created by Professor Ivo, named Anthony here instead of Arthur, who later partnered with Dr. T.O. Morrow to defeat the League in the 90s. Morrow was the creator of Red Tornado, and while we don't know if that applies to that character in the DCAU, it's a fun connection between androids that I wish we got more than five seconds of. Amazo is an important character to the DC Universe because his origin issue is actually what got the League their own comic book series, and although we don't really learn anything about Amazo that we don't already know, aside from the fact that his outfit is the silly thing I've ever seen, his Who's Who entry from 1985 gives us a bit more information on the character. This Silver Age comic book Amazo contained absorption cells, which allowed him to absorb the strengths and weaknesses of the JLA, but specifically they work on superpowered beings that he encounters. While this doesn't necessarily explain how he can conjure like a hawk girl mace or a green lantern ring, it does make sense that he can't just look at, say, Batman and suddenly have decades of martial arts training. It appears to be a nature versus nurture kind of thing, which I guess means he could take a look at Batman and absorb his pointy ass nose? Wait, that's not a superpower. But damn if that thing ain't pointy. Anyway, if we apply this concept to the DCAU Amazo, since his nanotech makeup seems to follow relatively the same rules, we can presume that he didn't absorb powers from anything inanimate. The majority of the superpowers he displays after returning to Earth involve his control over yellow energy, both offensive and defensive. First thing that comes to mind might be Sinestro's yellow ring, the origin of which we also don't get to know in this universe. Though we can talk more about that in the Yellow Weakness video I mentioned earlier, 50 years from now whenever now is. If it's anything like the comics, could Amazo have traveled to the Antimatter universe and absorbed the energies of Quard? It would explain his ability to blast right through the Green Lantern barricade and to conjure solid light constructs like this little shield or this hot girl moving bubble. It might even explain how he can teleport matter between dimensions like he does with Oa, if perhaps the place he sent the planet was the Antimatter universe. It's also pretty similar to some of the visual effects we see used on Justice League and Justice League Unlimited when Morgan Le Fay uses magic, or kind of like the energy used to shield and camouflage Gorilla City. And in the comics, Gorilla City was forged by aliens, and the DCAU gorillas used the same guns as Kryptonians. Hmm. But more likely, I feel Amazo's power set being colored gold is simply because he himself has evolved into a golden form, which he did by the end of Tabula Rasa before leaving Earth. And he's even surrounded by a yellow aura here already. It could be that because of absorbing all the Justice League's powers, mixing them together caused some kind of override cocktail in his programming which allowed him to begin his cycle of evolution. Unfortunately, it's all pretty speculative. I need to admit something. I started work on the script for this video, and for some reason I remembered incorrectly that the special effect on Amazo's Grundy at, at hand attack was the same special effect used for Stargirl's Cosmic Rod. It's not at all. It's not the same effect. So originally the script was kind of leading to that point. I was going to speculate about where the Cosmic Rod came from in this universe, and maybe that's where Amazo got that power from, etc. And then I put it on Patreon as a vote option before I realized that and it won the vote. <laughs> <coughs> so, you know, the video kind of went nowhere. <laughs>
The next one will be better. Thank you for watching regardless. But I would love to know what you guys think down under in the Australia box. Any ideas for specific space-based super people Amazo might have encountered and copied? Maybe he got that telekinesis from wherever the hell Miss Martian came from. If you liked this video, be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel slash ring that bell for more stuff like this every week. We do all sorts of deep dives into the DC animated universe and occasionally touch on other superhero properties like the animated DC movies, the DC universe original shows, and other fun stuff coming up in the future. Like I mentioned up top, this video was voted into existence by the amazing supporters on our Patreon, which you can find at patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower. Link in the description. There you'll find ways to get access to a ton of behind the scenes goodies like monthly coupon codes to our merch store, also linked below, and even monthly live chats with me, Maddie, and Ted. You can talk to us about pretty much whatever you want. It's a lot of fun, and half the time we just goof around for an hour while Maddie orders Taco Bell. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.